Hi, and welcome. I'm your host, Phil Klein, and I'm here today with Rick Steves, travel writer, author of numerous travel guides, host of TV and radio programs on travel, and an advocate of independent travel. While his books and media deal with travel mostly in Europe, his ideas are relevant for any of us who would venture from home and into unfamiliar territory. Rick, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks, Bill. Nice to be with you. So great to be together. Um, all right. So you have mentioned this idea of a traveler's mindset. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? You know, there's two kinds of travelers, and it's really determined by what you bring to your travels. And that's kind of a pre-existing mindset. Uh, a traveler, a good traveler to me, a good traveler's mindset is positive. It's uh, excited to get out of your comfort zone, to try new things. If, uh, if an opportunity presents itself, you say, yes, um, a good traveler's mindset is um, ready to, 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 to change, uh, to seek out a, a transformative experience when you travel. Um, a lot of people travel just to um, affirm the way they see the world. I travel to change my understanding of the world. And can you say a little bit about how that mindset is different from a tourist or a homebody mindset? Well, there's three kinds of travelers. Um, there's, in my, my estimate, if I was to kind of divide it up, there are tourists, there are travelers, and there are pilgrims. And a tourist, and there's nothing right or wrong about it, any of them, I just think it's fun to mix it all together. A tourist is as a, as a bucket list, you know, they want to check off famous things. Uh, a tourist um, is likely to say how many countries they've been to. To me, that means nothing because how many people did you talk to? How many precon preconceptions did you challenge? Uh, you know, that's not um, a function of how many airports you've landed in. Uh, but a tourist is looking for fun in the sun. A tourist is shopping. A tourist is re recreation. It's great. It's fun. It's a holiday. A traveler, I think, is interested in learning, in broadening their perspective, in trying new things to gain new appreciations. Um, I'm endlessly interested in just learning on the road. For me, the road is a school. And a pilgrim is uh, beyond that. I mean, if for a traveler, the road is school, for a pilgrim, the road is church. And <laughs> uh, you travel to seek. You travel to not learn about other places, but you travel to learn about yourself. Uh, that's a pilgrim. And as you travel, the mindset you bring with you determines if you're going to travel as a tourist, a traveler, a pilgrim, or a little bit of everything. Wow. So how would you say your travel mindset came to be? How did you get yours? How did it grow? Did you start out as a tourist and become a traveler or... You know, Phil, I can, I can assess that by looking back at a lifetime of travel. I've spent 100 days a year ever since I graduated from high school in Europe. My favorite countries, by the way, are beyond Europe, uh, India, Southeast Asia, Japan, and so on. But I've just decided my mission in life is to teach Americans how to travel. And for me, Europe is the springboard for world adventure. And if I look back on my teaching, and I've just been a workaholic about this, I travel 100 days a year, and I, I'm at home teaching the rest of the time. Uh, I've evolved in what I consider kind of a Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs. Back in the 1980s, it was just cheap tricks. I didn't have any money. I was just uh, slumming around Europe and learning from my mistakes and come home and teach people how to sleep on the train, how to find a, a good meal, how to, uh, you know, um, where to get a, a, a hotel and, and this kind of basic budget travel tips. And then in the 90s, I realized the most rewarding thing for me to teach was also the most rewarding thing for me to travel not just catching the train, but appreciating history, art, culture, cuisine, and so on. So I started writing books about art and history instead of guidebooks to where do you get a cheap meal. And I started teaching um, you know, history and art for the travelers. So I was sliding up Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs. And then after 9-11, I found myself realizing the beauty of a traveler is you are gaining a, a better understanding of the other 96% of humanity. And I thought that ultimate accomplishment for a travel traveler is to travel um, with this idea that we can learn more about ourselves and our home and our baggage 
by leaving home and looking at it from a distance. And that to me is the, just, the, it, it enables us to bring home the most beautiful souvenir. And that's a broader perspective. And that just carbonates my life. When I get home, I'm happier than ever to be an American, but I'm also a better citizen of this planet. And um, for me, that's just the endlessly gratifying and rewarding thing about uh, being fortunate enough to travel and explore the world, not just as a tourist, but as a traveler and as a pilgrim. So how would you say uh, that traveler's mindset or, you know, as you grow and, and go up that Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs, you, uh, how does that change the way and what you learn from your travels? Well, you learn from your travels by connecting, I think, with people who are different than you. One of the things I love about travel is I meet more interesting people on the road than I ever meet at home. I mean, some people travel by bringing the world to them at home. You can do that. It's a curiosity. Other people travel by venturing out and finding themselves in a situation where they're surrounded by things that are different. Sitting around uh, at, a, at, a, at a truck stop in Afghanistan while they're passing around a, uh, some marijuana and they're skinning a goat. Uh, that's a different experience. And I vividly remember that. Um, sitting naked in a sauna in Helsinki with a bunch of working class Finns that don't have enough money to have a sauna at their home or at their cabin, that's a great experience. Sitting in a salon in Warsaw, listening to people appreciate Chopin being played on a beautiful piano in his, the, 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 the country of his birth, that's a beautiful experience. I could list off all sorts of situations where I have been in a different situation and I've gained an appreciation. Worshiping with Coptic Christians in a city of 20 million Muslims in Cairo. That's an interesting situation to be in. Um, you know, I, I just love the, the thought of that. And you have that wherever you go. Now you can travel in a way where you're sitting on folding chairs with six tour bus loads of people watching slap dancing on stage. And then you can go back to your American style hotel and complain about the air conditioning or you can immerse yourself intellectually, emotionally, and physically in a foreign culture. Two different ways to travel and two different ways to learn. My, my challenge as a travel teacher is to inspire and equip Americans to travel in a way where they get out of their comfort zone and they risk changing themselves. I mean, culture shock, some people try to avoid it. For me, culture shock is the growing pains of a broadening perspective. I seek culture shock. I, I revel in a, just the exhausting emotional, oh, wow, I can't believe what I'm experiencing right now, feeling that you get when you put yourself in a situation that uh, is out of your comfort zone. And, and what does that do to your sense of what's normal or what norms there are? Does that change those? I love that. Uh, ethnocentrism is sort of thinking you are normal and we are not normal. <laughs> Americans are experts at thinking they're normal, but ethnocentrism is not just an American thing. Big cultures tend to be ethnocentric because if you're in a big culture, you could think you're the norm. Um, you, you remember the old concept of the ugly American? Well, ugly American just means an ethnocentric person. So it doesn't mean you're bad. You're just a little naive culturally and you think you're the norm. If you think, sitting on the toilet is normal, you're wrong. Squatting over a hole is the norm. I was on an on a airplane in India with a, a decal over the toilet in the airplane, and it was teaching people with a stick figure how not to stand on the rim of the toilet and squat over it. And it occurred to me, oh, I was wrong. I thought it was normal to sit on something when you go to the toilet. Um, I noticed in South Asia how comfortable people are sitting on their haunches. I can't sit. I, I was at a in Indonesia, I was at a village where there was one television and it was on a, on a post and everybody would gather to watch TV on the village square and watch television. And there was no chairs there. People were just sitting on their haunches. And it occurred to me, I can't sit on my haunch and relax and watch TV, but these people sit on their haunches naturally because all their life they've been sitting on their haunches. That's exciting. I, I'm changed when I recognize that. I'm humbled. It's pretty nice to travel with a mindset that you want to be humbled. Every time I'm humbled, I celebrate because I come home with a 
with a broader perspective. So thinking about um, being back at home or being at home, what would you say are the ways that a traveler's mindset can serve us when we're at home? Well, there's a lot of issues we face at home. And I, I think if the world wanted to be more stable and more peaceful and to trade better with each other and so on, <laughs> they would establish a fund and give every American a, f- a three month trip to someplace other than Hawaii or Cancun, you know, to really travel. And when you graduate from school, you get this little fund and you go traveling. Um, Europeans do that with their Erasmus program. They pay for people to work and study in different countries in the European Union just so they can be more uh, empathetic with each other. Empathy is an important thing. So when you're a traveler in your home, you have more empathy for other people. You're a little more humble about what the rest of the world is like. You have um, an appreciation of diversity. You, You celebrate diversity. You're less fearful. I mean, I could go on and on about the values of a traveler's experience, life, life view, life story, when they come home and just function as a citizen of their home country. But uh, think of uh, the challenges in America right now for diversity. People are afraid of diversity. If you travel, I think you become less afraid of diversity. I'm, I'm always impressed by how I come home thinking the world is filled with beautiful people. It's filled with love. It's filled with families. <laughs> it's filled with joy. Joy does not make the headlines, but there's a lot of joy. Uh, India is my favorite country. And I I think it's because in India, there's a lot of suffering and a a lot of heartache and a lot of squalor, but there's a lot of joy. And I think of India as bulk joy, a billion people all with a little joy celebrating it together. Now, of course, there's lots of problems in India, but there's so much joy there. And when I come home, I, I celebrate the world. I have an appetite for it. I want to get out. I want to be friends with the world. Imagine being friends with the world, having a mindset where you want to build bridges to the world rather than walls to protect us from the world. This world is getting smaller and smaller, and it's going to be more and more futile to build walls and barricade yourself behind, you know, in, in all of your, your privilege. Uh, we're in this together. It's related to fear also. Um, travelers are less fearful. There's a lot of fear in our country now. When I started teaching, people said, bon voyage. Now nobody says to have a good trip. They say, have a safe trip. Where did that come from? Fear. And who are the most fearful people? The people who have not traveled. People with no passports, people buried deep in the middle of our country. Uh, people whose worldview is shaped by commercial television news rather than actually getting out there and meeting people. Clear to me, and I've thought a lot about this because you know my business kind of depends on people not being afraid. Uh, So this fear frustrates me in a lot of ways, but most importantly, I just think it's dangerous for us to be so fearful. We're 4% of this planet. Fear is for people who don't get out very much. The flip side of fear is understanding, and we gain understanding when we travel. For me, travel, I went to a conference a long time ago when I was a kid up in Vancouver, BC. It was called Travel, a Vital Force for Peace. It was one of the most inspirational weekends I've ever had. And fear You conquer fear when you travel and you come home and then you're dedicated to understanding the rest of the world, playing ball with the family of nations, celebrating the diversity. That's, boy, I got over taking home kitschy little souvenirs a long time ago. My souvenir is this beautiful understanding that that we're part of an exciting planet. And if we could all just travel and get to know our neighbors, um, there's more than enough affluence to make everybody happy and still have room for people who are filthy rich. (laughs) <laughs> so a really wide and diverse world. Are there ways we can use a traveler's mindset um, in our daily lives as sort of an everyday toolkit for encountering uh, whether it's difference or diversity or the varied experiences uh, around us and enriching those a little bit? You know, Phil, I've thought a lot about that through COVID because basically we're all locked up for a year. And um, <laughs> my whole life has been ridiculously one-minded. I live and breathe everything, travel. I was walking home the other day and I saw a snail on my neighbor's fence and a white picket fence, snail on the top of it. And all I could think of was escargot. You know, I I just think in terms of travel, a culture, you know, this family of nations and cultures and so on. And when I was locked up throughout COVID, I was exercising this traveler's mindset here with no option to get on an airplane and travel. And I realized, I'm not, I don't regret it, but I realized that 
There's so many dimensions you could focus on. Some people live and breathe their garden. Some people are so into their dogs. Some people just can't get enough of cooking. Some people are just into all music, you know? It's all good. It's the weave of a life that is embracing creativity and collaboration and, and, and sharing and fun. Um, and I took this COVID lockdown as a chance to not be a traveler, but employ my traveler's mindset in things I never took seriously. Cooking. I just spent $1,000 for sharp knives. <laughs> a year ago, if you told me I'd spend $1,000 on knives, I'd say, you are out of your mind. My children, my kids don't, they, all they say is, who is this guy? I'm, I'm excited about the inventory of the fruit and vegetables in my refrigerator. I, when I sit down with my partner, we talk about the decisions we made and how to season the, the saute. Um, I would have never, ever, ever done that uh, before this period, this opportunity to embrace something new. Uh, I'm embarrassed about what I really thought about people who walk dogs until I had a chance to fall in love with two dogs and walk them. <laughs> I'm so thankful for that. It, I'm so tuned into nature right now. Every sunset is a devotional. I, I just can't get over how beautiful it is. It reminds me how fragile and precious our environment is and how we have to be stewards of our environment. Uh, being at home, I've, I've made myself be patient. You know. There's more to life than increasing its speed. I'm a very good capitalist. I'm a, I'm a very uh, productive person. And uh, suddenly I'm not able to make money. I'm not able to produce. And it's God's way of telling me to slow down, take a breath. I'm, I'm open to that. I've got to, I, I'm eager for that. I'm hungry for that. It's therapy for a workaholic. Um, I'm a privileged person. And now I'm aware that I'm in a community where there's a lot of darkness, a lot of fear, a lot of suffering a lot of unemployment, a lot of people wondering how are they going to pay their rent, a lot of people with loved ones who are sick. This is real. This is more important than anybody's vacation to Europe, and I'm tuning into it. So I'm taking a pause. I'm recognizing, okay, there's more to life than what I'm passionate about, and whatever anybody's passionate about, that's great, but there's many more dimensions to life. And I've spent the last year getting out of my comfort zone in ways that are kind of traveling while you stay at home. And I'm really thankful for it. It's been a beautiful year for me in that regard. I've learned a lot. And uh, let me ask, what would, you, what would you most like to leave us with? Well, I would most like <laughs> to leave you with that this world is a place that we need to embrace. Uh, and I've, I've said it just in the last few minutes, but uh, there's... There's a lot of serious challenges. I think the more we understand our world, the more we see that we can work together, the more that we can put ourselves in a mindset where we're more likely to build bridges and less likely to build walls. I think when we think about the future, considering our recent past with our fears and with our frustrations and, and with our challenge with this pandemic and so on, I think the challenges that are gonna confront us in the future are going to be challenges that are different than the challenges of the past. They're going to require embracing science. They're going to require good governance. They're going to require diligence on the part of the citizenry. They're going to re require families working together, the family of nations. Uh, the challenges of the future are going to be uh, impervious to um, conventional defense. They're going to be blind to walls. And we can do it, but we've got to be thoughtful and we've got to be able to step forward and, and, and recognize the challenges. And uh, I think if we, if we take with us a traveler's mindset with that, get out of your comfort zone, uh, try new things, be humble, learn from others, uh, be positive, uh, celebrate all the goodness and love on this world. It's not Pollyannish. Of course, there's serious challenges and so on. But um, we've got a lot to be thankful for. We've got a lot of power and uh, we've got a, a lot of ability to, to make a world a better place. I, you know, a lot of times in Europe, I find myself just blurting out like a little child giggles. Life is good. I, I just, that's what I, I'm, I'm on the top of a mountain in Switzerland or I'm having a great, incredible gourmet tapa in Basque country or I'm sucking on a, on a big hubbly bubbly in Turkey. And I just think 
life is good. And this last year or so, I've been thinking life is good for me. And if we play it right, life can be good for everybody. That should be our goal. And we can do that. Right. Rick, thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you, Phil, for the excuse to think about the value of travel and share why it's been such a joy in my life and why I'm so um, evangelical about the value of travel, especially the value of travel with the right mindset.